Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast at Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play. And of course, I hope you consider supporting this podcast. It is a 100% listener supported podcast, and I hope you value it enough to support it by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau. You can just go to joyfulvegan.com if you don't remember all of that. Thank you in advance. The most awesome announcement I have is that my new book is up on Amazon and other stores that sell books to pre-order, which means you get a discount if you pre-order the book. The Joyful Vegan, Staying Vegan in a World That Wants You to Eat Meat, Dairy, and Eggs is coming out in October, November 2019. And I cannot wait for it to be in your hands. You can blame the book for my sporadic podcast schedule because it consumes me. But I think you'll agree, I hope you'll agree that it's all worth it. Some of what you're going to hear today is in that book, and we'll talk about it another time. Today's topic is, I'm not evil, and neither are you, tribalism, ideology, and a call for unconditional compassion. Several years ago, I wrote The Ten Habits of Highly Effective Advocates, which you may have heard of as a podcast episode, you may have heard it as a talk, I've given it conferences, including my own Compassion in Action conference. The fifth habit I named is unconditional compassion. As you can hear, it's in the title of my um, my introduction to the podcast. It has been the foundation of my work since I started doing this work over 20 years ago. And it's my belief in this habit that seems to upset people more than any other belief I hold. Uh, let me read to you what I've said publicly, even though you've heard this a million times uh, in the last couple decades, if you've been following me this long, so you can hear for yourself what all the fuss is about. By definition, compassion isn't compassion unless it's felt for everyone, the guilty and the non-guilty, the kind and the unkind, the good and the evil, the people I like, the people I don't like, the human and the non-human. That's the thing about compassion. It has to be equal opportunity or it's not compassion. In other words, if I'm only compassionate to those who have never made a mistake or only to those who agree with me, or who look like me, or emote like me, or live like me, or vote like me, that's not true compassion. Being compassionate to those who are compassionate, or to those who agree with me, is easy. Authentic compassion means having compassion for those who are unlike me, or who disagree with me, or who have done wrong. And yes, by extension, by definition, compassion means extending it even to those who are not compassionate. When I say these words have upset people more than any other words I've spoken, I'm not kidding. And the way I know this is because of the vitriolic attacks I receive in response to these words from people on social media for the most part. I have to believe that people would never speak to each other in person the way they speak to each other online, even though it's also personally upsetting to be spoken to with such anger uh, and ire and vitriol, uh, even online. But I'm not really sure anymore. The current state of our country and the state of our world is such that adherence to ideology and tribe is dominating everything else. And the way we think about and speak to and talk about those who don't share our ideology or are part of our tribe um, are considered not even just not us. They're considered evil. And let me explain. We're living in a time when group loyalty and identity politics are valued more than reason, more than critical thinking, more than tolerance, just basic tolerance for another point of view and compassion. And it scares the bejesus out of me. A recent op-ed titled No Hate Left Behind by New York Times columnist Thomas Edsel examines this heightened partisanship. Here's how it opens. A recent survey asked Republicans and Democrats whether they agreed with the statement that members of the opposition party are, quote, not just worse for politics, they're downright evil. Just over 42% of the people in each party view the opposition as downright evil. In real numbers, this suggests that 48.8 million voters out of the 136.7 million who cast ballots in 2016 believe that members of the opposition party are in league with the devil. 
The mass partisanship paper was written by political scientists at Louisiana State University and the University of Maryland, and their line of questioning did not stop there. When asked, do you ever think we'd be better off as a country if large members of the opposing party in the public today just died? Some 20% of Democrats, that translates to 12.6 million voters, and 16% of Republicans, that's 7.9 million voters, do think on occasion that the country would be better off if large numbers of the opposition died. We're not finished. What if the opposing party wins the 2020 presidential election? How much do you feel violence would be justified then? 18.3% of Democrats and 13.8% of Republicans said violence would be justified on a scale ranging from a little to a lot. Now, this, of course, is not unique to Democrats and Republicans. The intolerant us versus them, you're either with us or against us mentality is a global phenomenon with actual real world consequences and killings in the name of ide- ideology. We, we see it all the time. In our world, the vegan meat eater dichotomy has been a real thing for a long time as has all manner of dichotomies whereby the animal advocate is on one side of the divide and a hunter, slaughterhouse worker, circus trainer, name anyone in the animal exploitation business is on the other. And for years I've shared my thoughts about how I choose compassion even in the face of cruelty because I believe that the more compassion I give, the more that gets created in the world. The more compassion I withhold, the less there is. Likewise, the more violence, and that includes thoughts of violence, I put out in the world, the more violence I create. One of my most listened to podcast episodes, I know you know which one I'm going to say, those of you who've been listening for a while, is called How to Talk to a Hunter or Anyone Else with Whom You Disagree. I wrote it, I don't know, 10 years ago. And I've received more positive responses to that episode than any other that I've done. And I invite you to listen to the full episode, which I recently re-released. And I'm not going to read it again here. I'm not even going to recap the story. But to recap the points I made in that episode, I suggested that when dealing with people with whom we disagree... We hold, you know, people who hold worldviews different than our own or drastically different than our own or even slightly different than our own. Number one, that we hold an intention of compassion, not judgment. And I'm going to come back to this idea of judgment a little further on. Number two, that we remember that everyone is a hero in his own story. Even though we know the cruelty involved in the slaughter industry or in hunting or name, name it, people who eat meat and hunt, for example, don't perceive themselves as evil monsters. I've talked about this ad nauseum on this podcast, and I go into great depths about it in my new book, The Joyful Vegan. But we have to understand that people generally see themselves as good and moral. Meat eaters see themselves as doing what they have to to survive and thrive. And of course, doing so where meat eating is socially sanctioned makes it even easier to justify. Now, there's lots of justifications people give, but you know they don't see themselves walking around. That's why we couch it in, well, I, I have to do this. You know, I need the protein. I, I would be sick otherwise. We have to couch it that way because otherwise we'd be challenged to look at ourselves more deeply and see that we really don't need it. And then if we're doing it just because we like it, then that obviously implies that we're um, compromising our own ethics. And so we all have experienced this. We've all done this ourselves. But that is the point. They don't see themselves as, as evil. They see themselves as doing something that is necessary. That's why the notion of humane meat, dairy, and eggs is so popular. Hunters see themselves as being humane and respectful. This is why hunters justify their killing in the name of conservation and population control. People have to believe that they aren't causing harm, and so they have to couch harmful behaviors in a positive light. And if you think you're going to persuade someone to change their behavior, first you have to convince them that their behavior even needs changing. And if someone perceives themselves as doing something good, and let's face it, most of us justify behavior we partake in uh, so that it does appear to be good and necessary, then you're going to make very little headway as you sit there insisting that they're wrong or bad or evil or cruel or whatever other things you think of them. All that's to say is it's really less about what I think of them and more about understanding what they think of themselves and kind of starting there and then having conversations. So number two in dealing with people with whom you disagree is remember that everyone is a hero in his or her own story.
Number three, stay focused on planting seeds of compassion rather than on changing minds. Revisit many episodes on my thinking on this. Number four, strive to be a model for compassion. We can't have compassion on our lips with hatred in our hearts. In other words, we have to live it ourselves. We have to practice compassion. We have to cultivate it even and especially when it is most challenging. More on how to cultivate compassion later on in the episode. And number five, be unwilling to make generalizations about people, rather see them as individuals. We all want to be seen as individuals, not just mindless parts of an identity tribe. Think about how one of our best tools for animal advocacy is encouraging people to see non-human animals as individuals. We need to practice that too. And of course, I know so many of you strive to do all of these things. It's what I love about all of you, my listeners, my audience. I know that we all strive to do this. It's one of the most difficult things to do, practicing unconditional compassion. It's so hard. When I was gearing up for the last Compassion in Action conference, I heard from a number of attendees who said they were really excited you know, to come to the conference, to learn these skills, to learn about compassion, to talk about compassion, and to be among like-minded people, to be among other compassionate people, you know, i.e., you know, it's a Compassion in Action conference. Obviously, it's a vegan conference, but it's also people who are geared toward this way of thinking, i.e., you. And indeed, connecting with like-minded people is vital, especially when we feel like an outcast among family and friends or coworkers or just in the world. And one of the magical aspects of coming to an event like the Compassion in Action Conference or VegFest or animal conferences is that you will be among like-minded people, you, that you'll speak the same language, that you won't be judged, that you can relax and feel safe because after all, you share a common ideal. Having a sense of belonging is vital to who we are as social creatures. In The Joyful Vegan, I write about how belongingness is one of our most fundamental needs, providing survival and reproductive benefits as well as emotional, cognitive, and physical ones. Our need to belong can be almost as compelling a need as food. In other words, humans have survived and thrived over these millennia because we bonded. As social animals, we evolved in small communal groups that relied on close alliances, sharing mutual goals, achieving common objectives, strengthening bonds, enhancing feelings of self-worth and esteem. It's so important to connect with like-minded people. It feeds us. It makes us feel good. It brings out the best in us. It makes us altruistic. It connects us. But what happens? When we share a common ethic of compassion or wellness, i.e. the desire to not eat meat, dairy, and eggs, just that basic desire, but we don't share the same viewpoints on a range of other matters, or even more, we just don't feel like talking about our viewpoints in other matters, or worse, well, I'll get to worse, what about people who share the vegan ideal in practice, if not in theory? People who don't eat meat, dairy, and eggs, and who are doing something to not contribute to the most egregiously violent industries on the planet, who don't eat meat, dairy, and eggs, but who don't vote the same way we do, or who have different worldviews? What about vegans who are religious, or who are not opposed to genetically modified organisms, or who just question or don't have a strong stance on one social issue or another? What do we do with the multitude of identities that make up who we are as human beings, vegan being just one of those identities? I ask this because there's a presumption among some vegans that if you're vegan, you're also liberal, socialist, atheist, feminist, intersectionalist, progressive, leftist, you're pro-choice, you're anti-vaccine, you're anti-GMOs. And then if you're not any and all of these things and everything that entails, then you're unwelcome or at least you don't belong, or you're an imposter, or that you welcome oppression. In response, you're accused of not being a real vegan anyway. I never thought she was a real vegan. He's a fake vegan. That's not vegan, right? Vegans can't kick people out of the club because there is no homogenous club, but they can deny people legitimacy and identity, right? So vegan ideologues decry, now decry, The use of the label vegan for anyone who doesn't tick all the boxes of what they say vegan means. And now vegan is supposed to mean all of these other things other than just not contributing to animal exploitation. And they call anyone who doesn't submit to their interpretation fake vegans. It's a kind of rhetorical excommunication. 
I've heard from a number of vegan men and women who feel there is no place for them in the vegan community because they don't fit into any of the above categories. They don't fit into all of the above categories or who don't want to be part of a community that judges and attacks them because of their other identities. And so as a result, most of them, not all, but most, just throw the baby out with the bathwater and would rather not be vegan. If people feel less accepted by other vegans who profess to be kind and compassionate and more accepted by non-vegans who don't judge their every move, they will naturally gravitate to people who make them feel good. No, it's not because they lack moral fortitude. It's because, as the research on belongingness shows, belongingness isn't satisfied simply by virtue of affiliation. It's satisfied when we form and maintain positive, stable, supportive relationships. When a group is dominated by criticism and condemnation rather than support and solidarity, people don't tend to stick around or join in the first place. And so a rhetorical banishment, well, they're not vegan, they're not real vegan, they're fake vegan, becomes an actual self-imposed exodus, adding to the already high percentage of former vegetarians and vegans. Am I saying it's the fault of judgmental vegans that people become ex-vegans? Let's just say vegans deal with enough pressure living in a non-vegan world, so it certainly doesn't help when members of a community with whom there is a shared value and expectation of compassion add even more strain. Nobody likes to feel judged. In other words, it's not enough to be a vegan among vegans. We need to feel accepted and secure as part of that group as well. On that note, here are some more words of mine that drew ire and inspired people to attack me online. If believing that it's better to eat plants rather than animals is the only thing we agree on, that's enough. That's a lot. Welcoming different political, social, or ethical views doesn't make us hypocrites. It makes us diverse. Being welcoming of diversity means also welcoming diversity of ideas, perspectives, and life experiences. There are plenty of organizations, associations, and groups you can join that celebrate conformity of thought, and that's fine. There's a place for them online and in our real lives. But most vegans are just looking for a community where they don't feel like a freak for not eating meat, dairy, and eggs. That should be the only price of admission. When I tell you that these words about unconditional compassion trigger Vitriolic attacks online, I'm sad to say that these attacks don't come from non-vegans, they come from vegans. And I've seen it again and again and again. And to be clear, I purposefully avoid most of the divisiveness I hear about. I'm not part of any online groups or forums, and for the most part, I follow my own rule about not arguing or engaging with people online. I mostly hear about divisiveness from others, but I see it myself, unfortunately, especially when I'm attacked in my own online homes. I try to stay out of the fray, especially online, because it's not conversations and dialogue and good old-fashioned debates that are being had. What I see is bullying, smearing, polarization, virtue signaling, claiming the moral high ground, and tribalism. And not only is all of this taking precious, precious, precious time and energy away from advocating for animals, like the time that people take attacking each other online. That time could be used to write letters to the editor about animal issues, teaching a class, tabling, doing outreach, writing op-eds, writing articles, calling legislators about pro-animal legislation, raising money for animal protection groups. Not only does it take away time from all of those things, it's toxic. All of it. You're either welfareist or you're abolitionist. You're either plant-based or you're vegan. You're either vegan for health or vegan for animals. We profess diversity, but what we really seem to prize is homogeneity, particularly homogeneity of thought and ideology. Being inclusive means welcoming different opinions and perspectives, but unfortunately, the binary identity divisions dominating politics, us versus them, in-group versus out-group, are all too apparent in the vegan community. Community. It's a microcosm of the larger world. But even more than that, there's not just the accusation that you don't belong or that you're an intruder or that you're fake. It's that you're evil. You can see that reflected in the surveys I mentioned in the beginning of this episode about how Republicans and Democrats view one another. Yes, we have social issues we need to address, but the response 
that the other side should die, that the other side is evil, that the other side is in favor of oppression, that the other side isn't even human, is so disproportionate a response. In response to that New York Times op-ed, one commentator uh, or commenter uh, wrote, uh, something. I, I never read the comments. My husband had to say, I know you're taking a break from the news because I am uh, because of all of this craziness and divisiveness. And it's just healing to just not be consumed by it every day. But he says, you really need to read this um, op-ed. You really need to look at this comment. And so he sent me the comment. I didn't read the other comments, but I looked at this comment and, and she wrote, I, I don't know why I think it's a she. Let's just say it's a she. Uh, said, this is all sadly true. This is in response to the op-ed. Very often I read a well-reasoned, thoughtful op-ed in the Times that attempts to give a nuanced view of a complex topic. I enjoy the piece, even if I disagree with it, because it makes me think. Then I read the most recommended comments, and one would think the author was advocating infanticide. We just cannot show any attempt to see or understand the other side of a complicated issue anymore. It's right or wrong, it's good or evil. I'm pretty left of center on most issues and have been my whole life, but I never thought I'd live in a time in this country where honest debate and civil disagreement would be in jeopardy. And that's what she wrote, and I agree, and it breaks my heart. That's where we're at. Everything said online or in person and then shared online is a litmus test. The New York Times article, No Hate Left Behind, talks about the rise in purity tests for politicians, such that if they don't adopt the line of the party on core issues, especially those to do with identity politics, they're subject to round condemnation. And any deviation is likely to be severely punished. Like I said about proportionality, being just a tiny bit out of step is seen as grievous as being completely out of step. And of course, people go from zero to 100 in the space of a moment, not giving anyone the benefit of the doubt, assuming the absolute worst, like the commentator, like the commenter said, you'd think I'd committed infanticide or that I'm out killing puppies and kittens or drawing swastikas on buildings simply for not towing the same ideological line. It's outrageous. We have forgotten how to agree to disagree. And while I stand by my rule of not having arguments online, if you don't like what someone says, just don't follow them. Like, don't read what they write. Like, don't subscribe to their podcast. But to wish them to disappear, to wish them to be wiped, wiped off the face of the earth or to be harmed or shouted down or silenced, that's really scary. <laughs> that's really frightening. I read a bit of Brett Stevens, another New York Times columnist, in the episode I did on vegan companies being bought by non-vegan companies, I read a bit of his brilliant piece called The Dying Art of Disagreement. And I'm going to read a bit of it here again. I hope you read the entire thing. There's a link on my website, but here's just an excerpt. Stevens talks about the liberal arts education he received at the University of Chicago. As I think about it, he says, I'm not sure we were taught anything at all. What we did was read books that raised serious questions about the human condition and which invited us to attempt to ask serious questions of our own. Education in this sense wasn't a teaching with any fixed lesson. It was an exercise in interrogation to listen and understand, to question and disagree, to treat no proposition as sacred and no objection as impious, to be willing to entertain unpopular ideas and cultivate the habits of an open mind. That is what I was encouraged to do by my teachers at the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago showed us that every great idea is really just a spectacular disagreement with some other great idea. Socrates quarrels with Homer, Aristotle quarrels with Plato, Locke quarrels with Hobbes, and Rousseau quarrels with them both. Nietzsche quarrels with everyone. Wittgenstein quarrels with himself. These quarrels are never personal, nor are they particularly political, at least in the ordinary sense of politics. Sometimes they take place over the distance of decades, even centuries. More importantly, they are never based on misunderstanding. On the contrary, the disagreements arise from perfect comprehension, from having chewed over the ideas of your intellectual opponent so thoroughly that you can properly spit them out. In other words, to disagree well, you must first understand well. You have to read deeply, listen carefully, watch closely. You need to grant your adversary moral respect, give him the intellectual benefit of the doubt, have sympathy for his motives, and participate empathetically with his line of reasoning. And you need to allow for the possibility that you might yet be persuaded 
by what he has to say. Intelligent disagreement is the lifeblood of any thriving society, yet we in the United States are raising a younger generation who have never been taught either the how or the why of disagreement, and who seem to think that free speech is a one-way right, namely their right to disinvite, shout down, or abuse anyone they dislike, lest they run the risk of listening to that person or even allowing someone else to listen. The results are evident in the parlous state of our universities and the frayed edges of our democracies. Can we do better? Yes, we disagree constantly. But what makes our disagreements so toxic is that we refuse to make eye contact with our opponents or try to see things as they might or find some middle ground. Instead, we fight each other from the safe distance of our separate islands of ideology and identity and listen intently to echoes of ourselves. We take exaggerated and histrionic offense to whatever is said about us. We banish entire lines of thought and attempt to excommunicate all manner of people without giving them so much as a cursory hearing. The crucial prerequisite of intelligent disagreement, namely shut up, listen up, pause, and reconsider, and only then speak, is absent. End quote. Being a joyful vegan means being confident in our vegan identity without undermining our other identities. It's something I talk about a lot in terms of interacting with our families and, and, and helping them understand that we're not rejecting them and what they taught us or our culture, but we're also embracing this other identity. That's what being a joyful vegan is all about. It's also about not excoriating people's other identities as vegans. And it means embracing a broader definition of diversity to include diversity of thought and ideology. There is no prescribed profile of what a vegan looks like, dresses like, worships like, votes like, or acts like, or at least there shouldn't be. We all contain multitudes, as Walt Whitman said. And so are we allowed to contain multitudes? Are multitudes welcome only as long as they're multitudes that tick the boxes of the tribe's ideology. And who decides? As written in the New York Times op-ed, No Hate Left Behind, there is no necessary reason why someone's position on abortion should predict their position on global warming, should predict their position on welfare, should predict their position on school choice, should predict their position on illegal immigration. These are all entirely logically independent Yet there is a natural tendency for alliance gravitation to pull people into sets, often binary sets, because issues are more often flags of identity, and it creates in-group dissension to have a multiplicity of views inside the group. Now, this is specifically about politics, but like I said about veganism, there is a presumption, prevalent now more than ever, that if you don't wear or eat animal flesh and fluids— and if you obviously support animal protection and you don't support animal abuse and you don't promote animal abuse and exploitation, that's not enough. Or to turn that around, if your message is unconditional compassion and being welcoming to everyone, that's not enough. Now, you're not really vegan if you don't fit into a particular profile prescribed by people who have appointed themselves the gatekeepers of the vegan identity. The result Aside from a cruel, scorched-earth approach where throwing Molotov cocktails at someone who doesn't think the way you do is mistaken for advocacy, the result is also a narrowing of the definition of what vegan means such that very few people can meet it, or even want to meet it, and a feeling that people with different ideas have to censor themselves for fear of arousing ire and outrage. Do your work, then step back and let others do theirs. Be kind. Be compassionate. It is the hard work of being human. It's why I have spent the last 20 years focusing on compassion as part of my work, which, of course, is an extension of the philosophy of how I tried to live my life. And if you don't like it, don't listen. That's why I spend countless hours writing podcast episodes and books and talks. It's why I put on conferences called Compassion in Action, because I believe that compassion is everything. 
I believe that placing conditions on compassion is fundamentally problematic. From the individuals we decide aren't worthy of our compassion because of who they are or what they may have done, to the entire groups of individuals we've decided don't deserve our compassion because they represent an idea or an ideal or an ideology that isn't aligned with our own, to the very obvious and detrimental way we have different rules for how we treat one species of animal over another based on who they are and based on how how we perceive them. These are just some of the ways that we are not being unconditionally compassionate. Now, for me, the phrase unconditional compassion is a bit redundant because by nature, compassion means you don't put conditions on it. But when it comes to the idea of compassion being unconditional, many people think it's impossible to have compassion for everyone, regardless of who they are or what they do, because they're afraid, they imply that that means you'd be condoning bad behavior or inappropriate, offensive, illegal, or violent behavior. Or it means that you'd be a doormat and you'd enable abusive behavior or you'd be justifying keeping untrustworthy or abusive people in your life. That's the implication that if you're compassionate, that you're condoning all of those things. None of that is what compassion is about. It's the opposite. Compassion doesn't condone bad behavior. It helps transcend it. This is so key because too many of us walk around thinking that if we're compassionate to people who do bad, violent, rude, or inappropriate things, you're condoning that behavior. And since, of course, we don't condone bad, rude, violent behavior, then we think it logically follows that we have to withhold compassion to demonstrate that we oppose that bad, violent, rude, or inappropriate behavior, right? We unconsciously, we consciously and unconsciously say it, but we consciously say it too. I'm not going to have compassion for them, whoever they are, slaughterhouse workers, animal farmers, animal abusers, hunters, people who test on animals, people who eat animals, people who don't eat animals, but still, I don't know, name it, wear leather or are part of a religion I don't like or are pro-choice or against abortion or a Republican or a Democrat or fill in the blank because they don't deserve my compassion. And so we make our compassion conditional. We treat it like a prize to be bestowed upon someone based on merit or worth that we decide. We treat compassion as a finite resource we have to hoard and ration. And that's what we do. We ration our compassion. You've heard, of me, talk, you've heard me talk about that before. Doling it out only to those we think deserve it. And we wonder why the world is not more compassionate. We wonder why there's not more compassion in the world. Compassion is a gift to be bestowed. It is not a prize to be awarded or withheld. Instead of giving it freely, though, we act like jealous lovers. We keep it for ourselves. We dole it out only to those we think have earned it, deciding who's worthy of receiving it and who's not, withdrawing it and withholding it accordingly. Now, of course, very few of us would characterize our compassion that way. We'd say, look, some people's behavior is too awful. It's too violent. It's too offensive. And it's because we care. It's because we're committed to justice. It's because we're ethical. It's because we're compassionate that we withhold compassion. Our commitment to virtue, to ethics, to justice compels us to decide who to show compassion to and who to withhold it from, right? It's ridiculous. And more than that, not only do I decide for myself who I believe deserves compassion and who doesn't, I'll decide for you too. You can hear how ludicrous all of this sounds. To demonstrate how compassionate we are, we choose to be unforgiving and intolerant and uncompassionate, right? We justify withholding compassion in the name of compassion. Well, if that's compassion, you can have it for yourself. I don't want any part of it, but that is not compassion. That's where we're at, though. I think there's a general consensus, especially among those who consider themselves the most righteous, the most justice-oriented, that to demonstrate or even express compassion for someone who does something wrong implies that you're saying that behavior is acceptable. And so out of fear that you'd be condoning bad behavior if you demonstrated compassion towards that person, you overcorrect and actually show as much vitriol as possible for whoever or whatever we think is wrong, signaling our virtue to others in our group in the meantime. If we weren't virtue signaling, we wouldn't do it publicly. So we virtue signal all the time. Every one of us, all of us do it. I know you don't do this, 
I know you don't do this, but I'm sure you could think of examples where you've seen someone doing this. Anyone for whom ethics and justice are used to masquerade a conscious withholding of compassion, and we support it socially. I'm sure you've seen this because as we've been discussing, there's a sense today where we think that the more moral outrage we feel about something, the more indignant we are, the more cynical and pessimistic we are, the more it shows we care. Or that if you're not outraged, indignant, cynical, and pessimistic and screaming all the time, then you're apathetic or you're delusional or you're willfully ignoring what's happening all around you. We've seen this play out in the vegan community in the ugliest of ways when animal advocates celebrate when a hunter is killed, for example, who cheer and celebrate and claim karmic justice out of compassion for the animals. That's not compassion. That's vengeance. There are a lot of examples of vengeance or what I call righteous vengeance in the vegan and animal protection communities. And we're all guilty of it because we're all human. And we all like the feeling of moral righteousness and moral superiority because the taste's so darn good. Nothing feels better than believing that we're unquestionably on the right side of morality and justice. It's not that we shouldn't ever feel that way. It's are we willing to do something to not hold on to that way of thinking, right? And when it comes to the innocent animals who are hurt and exploited and threatened every day, of course we're on their side, aligning with the animals who are victims of daily violence and cruelty. Of course we're on the right side of ethics. But here's the irony. Everyone thinks they're on the right side of ethics, regardless of what they're defending. Terrorists do, despots do, authoritarians do. Hitler and Stalin, in their own opinions, believed they were acting for the benefit of humanity. People like to feel right, including activists, especially those who are acting on behalf of the innocent, disenfranchised, or vulnerable. An exercise we did in the last Compassion in Action conference might be something you'd like to do on your own. And I encourage you to sit down and take that time to write down, one, who you have a hard time having compassion for. We all have people we have a hard time having compassion for. I do. Number two, who you think doesn't deserve your compassion because of who they are or what they've done or what they continue to do or what views they hold. Could be one person, could be many, could be a group. Number three, write down someone or some people you purposefully withhold compassion from a group that you might say, they don't deserve it. I'm not going to be compassionate to them. It could be a very specific person. It could be an entire population. It could be Republicans, could be Democrats, could be hunters, could be meat eaters, could be Catholics, could be Jews, could be Muslims, could be cats, could be rodents. Take time to write this down. Just write it down. Don't filter. Don't edit. Don't judge. We're going to come back to this before the end. And speaking of judgment, it's something I want to talk about because, again, now more than ever, I see a lot of talk about what it means to be judgmental in the context of ethics. Now, to reiterate, we're all guilty of creating conditions to our compassion. We do this in general, and we do this when we decide that someone's not worthy of our compassion because of something they did, especially when that something is harmful. We feel justified in being judgmental because we believe they're the guilty ones. We feel justified because a little judgmentalism is necessary because some things are simply wrong. And the way we know they're wrong is because we judged the person or situation and concluded that what is happening or what happened is not okay, that it's abusive or hurtful or illegal. After all, if we don't judge when things are illegal or ethically problematic, how would we function as a moral society? How would we create laws and rules of conduct? The answer is, of course we need to determine when something is wrong and then act accordingly. Practicing unconditional compassion, having a moral compass, doesn't mean we don't make evaluations and create consequences for offending behavior. But there is a difference between making a judgment and being judgmental. There is a difference between making an evaluation and being discerning and condemning someone. So, how do we do this? How do we be discerning without being judgmental? How can we know the difference? Number one, have empathy. Try to understand where someone else is coming from, their perspective, their history, their experience, their worldview. You may not like what you hear. You may not agree. But having empathy stirs compassion. 
And in the state of empathy and compassion, you're less likely to be judgmental. And again, to be clear, having empathy doesn't excuse bad behavior, but it helps to understand where it comes from. It helps us to find common ground and remember that we too might have had similar experiences. It humbles us. And I talk all the time about vegans remembering that we were once not vegan, <laughs> that there was a time when we weren't aware of what animals go through for meat, dairy, and eggs, etc. There was a time we were asleep. That's an example of remembering our story. We're less judgmental when we remember uh, that we could probably identify because we're all, we're all going through and experiencing the same human condition. So number two, similar to empathy, this is again, how to be discerning and not judgmental. Uh, number two is try to understand whose values are being used to frame the evaluation and why. For example, if you judge someone for eating animals because you believe it's wrong to eat animals, the question we have to ask is whose values frame am I enacting? Am I enacting, am I using my values to frame the evaluation or theirs, right? So according to my values, it's not okay to eat animals. According to their values, it's okay to eat animals. So remember what I said before about everyone being a hero in their own story. That's what I mean here. Being discerning means understanding what values someone is acting from without placing a judgment on those values, especially if we don't share those values. Maybe the values that compel someone to eat animals uh, are based on their religious beliefs or self-preservation. Perhaps they really think they're going to be sick if they don't eat animals. Maybe it's cultural pride. They think that it's going against how they were raised if they stop eating animals. Understanding the lens someone else is looking through, or at least understanding that someone else is looking through a different lens, means you're able to step back, look through their lens, hopefully, and evaluate, hmm, interesting, rather than judge. Does that make sense? I think one of the reasons we tend to be reluctant to do this is we think that it takes away from our values to understand someone else's. But that's also not how this works. Empathy is not a blood-sucking vampire. It doesn't take away from your values to understand someone else's. Be confident in yours and know where you end and another person begins. You can listen to someone else's different perspective without feeling like your own perspective is going to be tainted, right? Empathy is not a blood-sucking vampire. Three, finally, related to both, evaluate the situation rather than attack the person. Research shows that when judging others, we tend to over-attribute acts to people's personalities rather than to the variables in the specific situation. We judge the person rather than assess the point of view, right? We judge the sinner rather than the sin. We attack someone's character rather than have debates based on the strengths and merits of the arguments. In other words, ad hominem attacks don't reflect the desire to evaluate the situation. They just reflect the simple desire to judge. For example, if someone cuts us, uh, you know, cuts in line in front of us, we tend to see that person as selfish and insensitive. But if we cut in line, we have the situational need very clear in our heads. Well, I'm in a hurry and I need to do this just once. Okay, what's the big deal, right? <laughs> if they do it, it's like an attack on their, per they're a selfish person. But if we do it, we're like, no, 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 it's just situational. I'm not a selfish person. I'm just in a rush, right? So being judgmental means making inferences about uh, someone's overall worthiness or integrity or lack thereof. So avoid ad hominem attacks, period. So those are three ways we can be discerning without being judgmental. Judgmentalism can be very subtle because it masquerades as moral righteousness. In fact, if you're ever unsure as to whether you or someone else is being judgmental rather than being discerning, here is a simple guide. If the word evil ever comes up while discussing people you disagree with, you're no longer being discerning. Crazy is another red flag or bad, but it's usually evil or the devil. Those are usually <laughs> red flags that you have stepped out of discernment and into judgmentalism. If we're really trying to come from a place of compassion, that train has left the station once we write someone off or an entire group off as evil. As I illustrated by that New York Times op-ed, we're seeing it bandied about quite loosely these days to characterize someone or factions of people who we disagree with or who hold a different opinion or who has an ideology or does something we don't think is right. It's one thing to say that's problematic 
or that's dangerous, or that's harmful, or I don't agree, or that's illegal. I mean, those are, we can make those evaluations, but that's very different than saying they're evil, they're crazy, they're bad people, right? The problem is if you frame it like that, you never see the person's si- other person's side, the person's side. <laughs> or you don't even think they have a side because you've just written them off as morally depraved, right? What, they wouldn't have a perspective worth listening to if they're morally depraved, right? So that's easy. When we just write them off as morally depraved, we don't have to even consider their perspective, You never have to understand their perspective. And I would argue that it's a tactic to actually avoid understanding the other person's perspective. And it creates more division and more divisiveness. It creates an us versus them, scorched earth approach to ethics. You're either on the side of good or you're on the side of evil. And heck, if you frame it like that, who wants to defend evil? If you defend evil, you're evil. So better to side with the morally righteous than with those who are evil. Seems pretty clear cut, right? This kind of thinking is dominating public discourse such that even if you try to understand someone else's viewpoint who has been characterized as bad or evil or morally depraved, then you're supporting that evil or moral depravity too. And worse than that, if you think the other side is evil, then as we saw in the surveys in that study, you can very easily justify violence against those you deem evil. You can very easily justify the desire to have those people wiped off the face of this earth. It's a very black and white view of the world, and it's toxic, and it's potentially lethal. We see it in the human community, and we see it in the vegan community, and it's not okay. Not only is it not compassionate, and not effective and potentially dangerous, it's also disempowering. Because after all, evil is evil. By nature, evil can't be fixed. Like that's the nature of evil. Someone who's evil is inherently wicked with no hope of redemption. So it's a very disempowering perspective to hold because it means that we're admitting there's no path for solution, which turns to cynicism. So I would argue that it's disempowering but also that it's a form of both arrogance and apathy. Because by writing others off as evil or crazy means we're essentially and conveniently off the hook. In other words, the convenience of having a rigid judgment is that we never have to look at our own character or nature or our own behavior or our own thoughts. As long as we keep the criticism on others or characterize someone else as bad, or evil, or crazy. We never have to look at ourselves. Our judgmentalism precludes self-examination. More than that, deeming someone else as bad, or evil, or morally depraved, or unfeeling, or uncompassionate, or crazy, characterizing people this way, means we're off the hook for having compassion for him or her. Because it makes it really easy to justify not having compassion for someone who isn't decent anyway, Another way of saying this is they don't deserve my compassion or why would I waste it on them? Why would I waste it on someone who isn't even compassionate? In other words, if we conclude that someone else is bad or indecent or evil or crazy, the onus is on them and I don't have to do anything. However, if I see them in more nuanced terms, if I evaluate based on empathy values frames and not on ad hominem attacks, then the onus is on me and I would have to conjure up compassion for them. So it's a lot easier to write them off as bad or crazy. It's just easier because we know what to do with that. But seeing them through the lens of compassion, what do you do with that? How do you conjure compassion for someone who creates harm? How do you conjure compassion for someone who creates suffering. This is my perspective. If someone violates someone or hurts someone else or kills someone else or needs to dominate someone else or threaten someone else, it's an indication of not simply the presence of evil, but rather it's the absence, it's the lack of compassion. It's the absence of empathy. It's the absence of awareness and consciousness. It's a lack of connection. The solution is not to withhold the very things that are missing, the compassion, the empathy, the awareness, the consciousness, the connection, but to fill the lack, to fill that void with exactly what's missing. Compassion, empathy, awareness, connection, consciousness. Do you see what I mean? It doesn't matter who fills the void. 
What matters is that the void is filled. And let me tell you something. The people you think are the least deserving of compassion are probably the ones who need it most. Where there is the absence of compassion means there is a need for more compassion, not less. What's more is that compassion has nothing to do with the actions of the person or the criminal or the crime or the behavior. It has everything to do with who you are and your behavior, right? How you act and who you are doesn't change who I am and what my values are. Compassion isn't fickle. Compassion is compassion is compassion. Compassion has nothing to do with someone else's behavior. It has everything to do with my own. Compassion doesn't ask, are they compassionate and thus worthy of compassion? It asks, am I compassionate? By definition, that's unconditional compassion. One of my favorite chapters in the Tao Te Ching, and many of you know I'm memorizing this book because I think it's the most incredible book. My goal last year was to memorize six chapters. They're short chapters. I've memorized maybe 30 because it is the most comforting thing I've ever done. Uh, And one of my favorite uh, chapters in this ancient text written in the sixth century by Lao Tzu, or at least it's attributed to Lao Tzu, uh, is chapter 49. She is good to people who are good. She is also good to people who aren't good. This is true goodness. Having compassion means showing it to everyone, whether or not they're compassionate. It means your conduct or perspective isn't dependent on external factors. It's not the quality of the recipient of your compassion that matters. That's irrelevant. It's the quality of your compassion that matters. That's what it means to be compassionate. The rest is not your business. This is not a call for apathy. It's a call for knowing what is yours to fix and what is not. It's a call for looking at our own lives, honing our own skills, cleaning up our own messes. I've got enough on my plate just trying to do my work and do it well. I'm busy enough trying to be a good friend, a good wife, a good neighbor, a good cat mom, a good daughter to aging parents, a good neighbor, a good advocate for animals, a good citizen of the world. The last thing I have time for is to make sure that everyone else is living the way I want them to live and behaving the way I want them to behave to decide if they're worthy of my compassion or not. Less compassion in the world means less compassion in the world. By withholding compassion for someone else or from a circumstance, I'm withholding it from myself and I'm withholding it from everyone. And that doesn't serve anyone. More compassion in the world means more compassion in the world. Compassion fills the void that would or could otherwise be filled with anger, violence, disconnection, isolation, apathy, suffering. But vegans would say, well, of course I don't withhold my compassion. My heart is open. That's why I'm vegan. Well, yes, You might be vegan because of your compassion for animals, but the question we have to ask ourselves is, does our compassion stop there? Because compassion doesn't mean having sympathy only for the victims. It means having sympathy for everyone involved. It may mean having sympathy for the perpetrators who may be suffering from their own ignorance or their own limitations or their own inability to connect or their own inability to feel or their own inability to have compassion. They may be suffering because they're desensitized to their own compassion or to someone else's suffering. Detachment, separation, disconnection, that's all suffering. And compassion is the remedy. That's why compassion doesn't condone bad behavior. It transcends it. It recognizes where there is lack and it fills the lack with compassion. So how do we actualize this? I'm going to end with this because Compassion itself can sound kind of nebulous, right? Be compassionate. I'm compassionate. What's compassion, right? I want to break it down. We did this in the last Compassion in Action conference. How do we begin to have a new understanding of compassion and thus a new relationship with and a new interaction with the world so we can all take compassion into the world? And when that survey is done again about one group over another group, it's a much smaller number that we can embrace people who don't think the way we do and look the way we do and vote the way we do and all of the things that make us, again, multitudinous. So how do we do this? How do we take all of this and actualize unconditional compassion in our daily lives beyond being vegan? So here's a way to think about it that I think simplifies it. And this is what I'm going to encourage you to do at home. 
rather than just say, be compassionate, that's kind of fuzzy wuzzy, right? What if we broke compassion down into its elements, right? If we identified the features, the elements, the, the, the aspects of compassion, then it's easier to practice and implement and foster these elements, right, of compassion. So we did this in the, in the, in the Compassion in Action Conference. So for instance, I can certainly ask you to pause right now and ask yourself, what, what are the elements of compassion? What makes up compassion? What does it mean to be compassionate? What are the features of compassion? You can pause right now and you can write these down yourself. I'll tell you what we came up with in the, in the conference. Uh, we came up with a, a list, right? So here are some ways that, that here are some of the features of compassion. Paying attention, being fully present, showing up, being vulnerable, asking questions, listening, being silent, having insight into someone else's experience, being kind, being caring, being empathetic, being responsive fostering connection rather than separation, having understanding, alleviating suffering, being, uh, having humility, forgiving, having acceptance, having courage, not holding back, not giving into fear, and of course, taking action. So I might just say, oh, come on, be compassionate. Let's demonstrate compassion. And you'd be like, yeah, what does that mean? I don't even know what to do with that. But if I said, have understanding, be empathetic, foster connection rather than, than disconnection, rather than separation, be respectful, uh, be caring, be responsive, be present, be silent, listen, right? Those are things you can go, oh yeah, I know what that means. I know what that looks like. I can do that. So that's what I'm encouraging you to do is break down what you think it means to be compassionate and then foster those skills in your life. So that is one way I think we can manifest and actualize compassion in our daily lives. Number one. Number two is to practice compassion, we have to exercise that muscle. Practically speaking, you may be able to manifest these things more easily if you devise a particular practice that creates a space um, for cultivating this muscle. Just like with our physical muscles, you have to, you have to strengthen them in order for them to grow. It's the same thing here with any, any quality we want to hone. We need to devise a practice to, to cultivate it. It might be a stillness practice for you. It might be a silent practice. It might be a practice of meditation, of prayer, of contemplation, of writing, journaling, or reading. It might be a mantra you say throughout the day, or as I said, memorizing a text that is meaningful to you. It could be poetry. It could be a religious text. It could be a spiritual text. It could be anything. Um, Having media and technology blackouts, I will say, I think helps. Reading inspirational literature could be watching inspirational people or listening to inspirational people. Focusing on people who model this behavior, finding teachers, connecting with like-minded people, and disconnecting yourself from the things that threaten your compassion. So one thing, I, so those are all ways to cultivate compassion, right? For Patreon supporters, I'm going to be sending you the loving kindness meditation I practice every day. I shared this with the folks who came to the conference, so some of you may have already seen this. This was actually the two years ago we did the loving kindness meditation, and I'll share it with you on Patreon. Um, and if you're a supporter, you will you will get this. It's incredibly powerful. Um, the loving kindness meditation. It takes. 15 minutes a day. It is a powerful way to start your day. It changes the course of your day. It changes your mind. It changes you. So number two, to actualize compassion in our everyday lives is to practice it, cultivate it, cultivate that muscle. And number three, surround yourself with compassionate people. We really do become what we focus on. I am so blessed, so lucky to be married to the most reasonable, considerate, kind, compassionate, thoughtful, patient person. He really is. David is amazing. He inspires me all the time, but so do all the people I surround myself with. We, I have a very a beautiful group of people around me who inspire. All, we each inspire each other to go to the highest place. We do that for each other. If, if we surround ourselves with people who aspire to compassion rather than who go low, 
and then we'll do the same. And that means online and in person. It means both. So that was number three. And number four is kind of the flip side of, um, of that is be aware of what threatens our compassion. So same thing. You can pause and you can write down what are the things that threaten compassion? That what, what are the things that threaten all those features of compassion? What threatens empathy? What threatens our, our ability to connect? What threatens our, um, our, our ability to be still or to listen? What are the things that threaten those components of compassion? Well, we came up with fear, arrogance, ego, desensitization, kind of not being in tune with it, closed-mindedness, numbing, uh, dissociation, compassion deficit. Uh, one of the things that um, there's something called the Gyges effect, which is the facelessness, um, compassion shutdown, online aggression. That's what we see online is the trolls, the Twitter shaming, the, the cyberbullying, all of that. Um, that threatens compassion. Uh, it might be a, be it might be being around pessimistic or closed minded or ungenerous people. So that goes back to number three: surrounding yourself with compassionate people, and perhaps getting off the internet, or at least having you know bouts where you're off the internet, or at least where you're only in groups where you're supported. Um, and then, and I will say that just in terms of just being open, you know, this is again, what, what can threaten our compassion? Well, close mindedness, right. And, and being in a faction and being tribalistic and, and all of those things we talked about. So to counter that, subscribe to newspapers and newsletters from organizations that hold different viewpoints than your own. Get out of your bubble. Just, it could be slightly different. It doesn't have to be something so extreme that you just don't agree with at all and you're angry, but something that's just different. You know, it could just be a different newspaper. If you right now read the Wall Street Journal, read the New York Times. If you read the New York Times, read the Wall Street Journal or uh, or the Nation or read uh, the whatever. I mean, just something different, right? Read articles by people of an opposing party. Read the positions and watch watch talks um, from people who are in a different party. Uh, talk to meat eaters and listen to what they have to say about animals. Listen. Don't talk. So the idea is if you're aware of what fosters compassion and what threatens compassion, you can implement the former and keep the latter in check. Now, this is not to say that striving for unconditional compassion or just compassion is striving for sainthood. It's not that you will never feel impatience, anger, intolerance, arrogance, aggression, or self-righteousness. But being committed to compassion means that you're willing not to act on these feelings, that you're willing not to cling to these feelings, and that you're willing to take the necessary action to transcend them. Is this challenging? Yes, every single day. Is it impossible? No. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. The more you practice, the more your brain will recalibrate, the more natural it becomes, the stronger it becomes. It is a muscle indeed. It takes practice, commitment, willingness, openness, preparation, intention, and courage to want to foster compassion and all its elements. Just because we have the capacity for compassion doesn't mean we don't have to exercise it, just like we have to cultivate our physical muscles. If we don't, they atrophy. And remember, moral self-righteousness masquerading as compassion, it's dangerous. Compassion without discernment turns into moral outrage and vitriol and tribalism and separation. And none of that is what compassion is about. Compassion is fierce, but not ferocious. It's wise, but not arrogant. It's sensitive, but not fragile. Compassion doesn't make you complacent. It gives you agency. For the animals, this is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. Thank you for listening.